HBCU stands for Historically Black College and University. That's actually a designation that didn't even exist uh, until the late 20th century, 1960s, 1970s. That was a government designation. Prior to this, they were simply known as Negro schools or Negro colleges or black colleges. The million and one half dollar drive is on. Mrs. Van, treasurer of the Pittsburgh Courier with Dr. Patterson, and William Nunn. The journalists and educators discuss plans for the drive which will benefit the major Negro colleges. Historically, black colleges and universities stand for more than just what those four letters say. They stand for, in my opinion, legacy, hope, benefit, culture, and the uniqueness are really what I feel that HBCU stands for. Because for some students, a culture of love and support from people who look just like them it can change their world. As a young person, just stepping out on your own, going to college, the last thing you want to have to deal with is getting over someone's biases or dealing with microaggressions. We got too many young kids not leaning in on others. There is no shame in asking for help. So we need to make listening cool in the classroom and we also need to make listening cool in the household so that kids can have the longevity they deserve. One of the things that I learned being an HBCU grad is that if you prepared, if you had the skill sets in place, that you could do almost anything. That you were just as good as anyone else. Black people who tend to graduate from HBCUs, from what I have seen, have been more secure, have been a little bit more successful. They have a sense of self and a sense of confidence, and they have a huge network that just supports them from the beginning of their career through the end. A lot of times people underestimate us. I tell my students and for myself, that's a good thing because you use that underestimation to your advantage. Because they underestimate you, they won't be ready for you when you come in the door. Will the members of the class of 1962 please stand? Man, you finished from an HBCU, you got some scar tissue. You've climbed the rough side of the mountain. You've handled a lot of adversity. You've had challenges in your life. You have overcome. You sidestep disaster. That's who I want running my organizations. That's the beauty of our culture and of our people, you know, is that we want people to succeed, and I think that's the real genesis of what HBCUs were and what they are now, is that it gives us an opportunity to become the very best that we can be. When you think about the history of the academy, uh, when you look at uh, the sciences, the humanities, and how they're being administered, particularly here in the United States of America, it's following a Western model. All these institutions were founded to educate wealthy white men. Uh, and it's not until you reach into the mid-19th century that you begin to see some pushback through this era of the common man, the Jacksonian era of people saying, look, you know, we want white men who aren't property owners to have access to higher education. We want women to have access access to higher education. Ultimately, you also have African Americans who say, look, we want a pathway towards improving and bettering our lives, and we understand that higher education is going to be a part of that. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Well, the early days of education for African Americans was quite challenging because there were laws that prevented the enslaved from learning how to read or to write because if they got a little bit of education, if they learn how to read, if they learn how to write, you know, then they would be considered a very dangerous threat. Uh, when you begin to educate someone, you enlighten someone. And when you enlighten someone, they begin to question. Uh, and that's something that white Americans did not want black people doing. And so that becomes uh, something that African Americans, they fought against. African Americans educate themselves in the dangerous shadows of the plantations, learning by candlelight, hiding the literacy books that they, that they did have an opportunity to, to get a hold to. There are many narratives of African Americans saying that their slave owner or a daughter quietly and secretly taught them how to read. And if they were caught, it was punishable. 
When you think of that legacy of literacy, uh, when you think of people like Frederick Douglass and the North Star and many of these anti-slavery newspapers that are being established, they are circulating throughout communities, particularly in the North. And so it's really become sort of an underground network of people passing these books, which are illegal, into the African-American community where these ideas and messages of liberation can be spread. We know that literacy existed in the Deep South, but it's in the North where you have the presence of these institutions founded in 1837, founded in 1856, founded in 1858. These institutions are being established to create opportunity and space for African Americans to be educated in mass. So by the time we hit 1865 and slavery comes to an end, it's there that you begin to see a proliferation of institutions for higher learning in the Deep South. I got your resumes, and they're in alphabetical order. Okay, now we need to chat. Why? I need to see a sea change from what I have in this folder to your second draft. We need to be critical, clear as to what is at play. Your resume is your ticket to ride. Your resume is the ticket to the party on the what? The 4th of April, your mock interviews. I tell my students, even though I teach in a historically black college and university, I never had a black teacher in my life. All my teachers were white. What do you wish to occur within the next five years? If I ask you what you do for a living, would you call it work? Would you call it effort? Would you call it drudgery? When I went to college, I just wasn't going to college for my parents. I was going to college for everybody in that neighborhood. We will go through a number of the questions, and all I want you to do is just select maybe seven, eight, maybe nine that really pique your interest. Be bold, be daring. What is the intrinsic nature of teaching at an HBCU? Teach the unteachable, reach the unreachable, and by all means, be patient with the late bloomers. More than 50% of the students, the kids that I stand before, every Tuesday and Thursday are first generation. More than 40% of those kids in my class come from households in which their parents can't even give them a dime towards their education. Being broke is temporary, but being poor, well, that's a disabling frame of mind. I don't see my students as they are now. I see them as who they'll become in the next five, 10 years, whatever. Now, who is the young lady behind me? None other than a former TA. And in a matter of weeks, this child will walk across the stage and receive her Master's of Business Administration. Hi, everyone. My name is Lindsay Haberman. I'm a second year MBA student, like Dr. Kimbrough said, from Baltimore, Maryland. As you guys go into the mock interviews, um, be comfortable. Don't try to, like, craft a response in your head, but make it natural because the world is competitive. There is a huge difference between persistence and perseverance. Persistence is performing a routine task in an area, in a discipline, when you know the decided outcome. That's persistence. But what is perseverance? Okay, performing a daily task in a discipline, in an area, when you don't know the decided outcome and you still persevere. And that's what my students are doing. They are persevering because they don't know the outcome. So many people want to make an impact and so many people want to make a difference. And my response to them is be that individual who inspired you to somebody else. And I guess that's my mindset whenever I walk into a classroom. At the end of the Civil War, the emancipation of the enslaved, you see the establishment of schools, primarily in churches, primarily established by religious organizations for uh, African American newly freed across the country. So the basics were taught how to read, how to write, and how to do uh, arithmetic. It was separated. 
It wasn't something that a black student could go to school with a white student. So it promoted a sense of you are learning to do work for us and that's all you're here for, is to learn how to be a better worker for us. Many of the HBCUs were founded during that particular time. They were established not just as a college, but they were established also uh, to provide grammar school, high school, and subsequently teaching education, training for ministers, training for agricultural skills in order to better prepare African-American boys and girls, young men and women uh, to be able to manage in a very racist and hostile society. The first HBCU is the Institute for Colored Youth. It's founded in 1837. It ultimately was the product of the Quaker community uh, within Philadelphia. A will was set aside, and in that will, uh, it provided opportunity for the education of black people in the city of Philadelphia. Ebenezer Bassett is the first African-American principal of the institution. He's making this an institution where the students who attend here can not just be exposed to higher education, biology, chemistry, math, science, but they're also being exposed to the concepts of cultural nationalism, of the importance of building black institutions and supporting black institutions, of countering white supremacy. John Brown will recognize the significance of the Institute for Colored Youth. Frederick Douglass, he's going to visit the Institute for Colored Youth. Henry Highland Garnett, these are all major civil rights figures. They all understand and recognize the Institute for Colored Youth and, and, the, and the significance of this space and this place uh, within Philadelphia. You really didn't find schools in the South until after 1865, but once that took off, you see schools springing up everywhere throughout the Southern states. By the time you reach the early 19-teens is where you begin to see the highest point for, for black colleges in this country, uh, well over 100 in existence at that time. Uh, you have the Atlanta University, which was founded in 1865 to educate the sons and the daughters of slave owners, which later became one of the premier university and institutions where later W.E.B. Du Bois would teach. James Weldon Johnson, the author of the Negro National Anthem, was a student there. You had the Augusta Baptist Institute, which was a school created for the training of black men and male preachers. That school eventually decided to relocate to Atlanta, and it became the Atlanta Baptist College. And subsequently, around 1912, it was renamed Morehouse College in honor of Henry uh, Lyman uh, Morehouse. You had the creation of Spelman College and Morris Brown College in 1881. Spelman College, founded by two white patrons from the North, Sophia Packett and Harriet Giles, founded in the basement of Friendship Baptist Church. You have, in 1881, the first school established in Georgia by African Americans in the basement of Bethel AME Church, Morris Brown College. And so just right here in the city of Atlanta, you had these great historic schools being established. And that was being duplicated across the country. Howard University established by the Freedmen AIDS Bureau, named for the secretary of the Freedmen AIDS Bureau, General Oliver Otis Howard, Booker T. Washington, who graduated from Hampton University, was appointed to come down to a small rural town in Alabama called Tuskegee. And he created this great university. They are producing a virtual who's who of black America, PWIs. Predominantly white institutions did not in mass uh, welcome African Americans, and so they were educated at Howard, they were educated at Fisk, they were educated at Morehouse and Atlanta University. In a number of these schools, you had white educators, quite a number of them, who were educated. And for instance, at Morehouse and Spelman, most of their early faculty members and presidents were non-African American but they were men and women devoted to teaching and training these students. And so by 1880, 1890, you have a group of students who've graduated, and now they are the teachers and the educators. 
I'm always intrigued with the early students of many of these colleges and universities and what a tremendous sacrifice it must have been for them and their families in order to get them in school and to pay the modest tuition that was required in order for them to learn. And so they were expected to make a contribution to their communities. You have the spirit of idealism where young black men and young black women can be exposed to an idea that challenges them to think about democracy and citizenship in new ways, in a country which said that they weren't citizens, in a country that denied them democracy on a daily basis. Black students are being exposed to that paradox, and black educators and black teachers who emerge from these institutions, they take that message and they pass it on to the children they are educating. You have Elizabeth Evelyn Wright, you have Mary McLeod Bethune, great black women establishing schools in a time that was unheard of for women to establish schools. Beyond the school that she creates, Mary McLeod Bethune is found on every HBCU campus. She's visiting these institutions. She's passing on these messages. She's empowering young black men and women, all based around the idea of how do we prepare our students to confront white supremacy in this society. And Mary McLeod Bethune plays a critical role in that. She becomes good friends uh, with Eleanor Roosevelt, good friends with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. She's part of the first wave of what they refer to as FDR's Black Cabinet. She's there advising them on race-related matters within the White House. Mrs. Bethune is off to the San Francisco conference as a special consultant. She received the appointment from the State Department. To have someone like that who's an advocate, who's an intermediary for black people in the 1930s and 1940s, and to be a black woman at that is extremely rare. So Mary McLeod Bethune is a titan of the black liberation movement, and her legacy looms large over HBCUs and over black America in general. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, the southwest side of Atlanta, Georgia. I kept my head in my books and I kept focusing on sports as well, so it took my mind off of everything else that was happening around in my community. I'm getting my master's in business administration. I'm concentrating in sports and entertainment management. Going to all black educational institutions, period, from high school all the way to college. Uh, I say it, it will nurture me for sure. Well-dressed Wednesday or, or suit day, as a lot of people like to call it. Um, so mostly all the business students or people in general are supposed to wear or look their best in a business professional setting, so. This is the first impression. Like, this is the first thing people see when they walk in. So, you know, you want to make sure your first impression is a lasting impression. Hey. Hey, baby. Oh, my God. Both of my parents, they attended Clark Atlanta University. They were both extremely active on campus. Yeah, you know, I'm always tired. My husband and I met here at Clark Atlanta University. We got our training here. We were nurtured here. And our kids, they just gravitated to attending HBCUs themselves. And so now we've got a, a richer legacy here at CAU. They wanted to feel a sense of self. If you know where you come from, you have a better, stronger sense of who you are and pride to be able to move forward. Like they say, it takes a village to raise a child. My village was people that attended HBCUs and Clark Atlanta being one of them. When I first made my decision to come to HBCU, my, uh, my friend who was actually going to PWI decided to tell me, oh, well, you know, the world's not black. Your yeah. whole life to be a minority, bro. Right. You've been a minority before you came here, you're right. going to be a minority after you leave here. Going to HBCU, if anything, teaches you to love yourself. Um, so yeah, both my parents are actually Haitian immigrants. I'm the very first person in my family to even get a college education. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy to be here. And I get this experience to be amongst y'all. Now I got to share my experiences with y'all, y'all get to share your experiences with me. I feel like that's all HBC really is, it's just one big family. No matter what you look like, your skin color, your ethnicity, race, religion, family, we're one big family. That's true. It's an experience you don't get anywhere else. Yep. 
You can be yourself. You can be who you are. Let me learn about you while you learn about me. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Just walk into class or even walk into the cafeteria. I'm walking the same places where my parents walked and went to class. It's rich history. It's, it's home. It's a different type of swagger that you have coming out of a HBCU. It just shows that I'm proud to be black and I'm proud to be successful and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. You wear it with pride. Schools for blacks and whites were not equal. They were not equal because they didn't have the resources that they needed. They didn't have the funding that was necessary. These segregated schools become spaces and places which immediately out the gate are going to be deliberately and systemically underfunded, undercut by state funders, by federal government. We love to say within the black community proudly that these are institutions that, that did more with less, but we often um, do not openly embrace and talk enough about the injustice behind that of how that underfunding is a part of the legacy of segregation and how segregation impacted black communities, not just HBCUs. In the 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson, the court had to decide whether segregation was constitutional. The decision was yes, as long as the facilities for both races are equal. Separate but equal became the law and the custom in some southern states. In 1954, the court rendered a verdict of far-reaching social significance by its decision that segregation in tax-supported schools is unconstitutional. Arkansas's governor, Orville Faubus, ordered the continuance of segregated schools. Violence occurred as anti-integrationists prevented the enrollment of Negro pupils in hitherto all-white schools. The integration of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954 created better opportunities for black students to get a better education as an elementary or high school student, which ultimately prepared them to go off to college. Brown versus Board of Education uh, is a critically important moment um, for HBCUs. The NAACP understood that making a case for integrating education was low-hanging fruit. Black folks paid into their taxes just the same as, as white folks did. And in doing so, it was very clear and evident that black education was not being funded fully. But let's be very clear about this, is that that doesn't really mean a lot for HBCUs in terms of all of a sudden doors of resources being open. Uh, in fact, there are a number of HBCU proponents and educators who were concerned that that all of a sudden was going to mean that HBCUs were going to close their doors. It was important that the classroom would be declared equal, although it took years for that to really happen in terms of, of resources. You don't see the integration of schools for some until the 1960s. But the times were changing, and HBCUs have always had to adapt to the change in times. In terms of intellectual resources, in terms of empowerment, in terms of emboldening young men and women to believe in themselves, there could be no better space for African Americans. Today I'll be recording my session. I'm so excited. Oh my goodness, I used to love Justin Bieber, this is crazy, because like these three, like Drake, Akon, had me in a chokehold, oh my gosh. Elton John, I'm in the beginning stages of my album, so excited. Who knows what will be on there, some exciting surprises, but I'm writing everything, I'm producing everything. I don't wanna wait, no more. I don't wanna wait, no. Music is my passion. It started when I was two years old. Uh, my father's a classical pianist, and we always had pianos in our house. That had an impact on me from very young because it's just never gone away. Thank you. I attended um, all Catholic schools growing up, primarily white schools. I was bullied a lot. 
being mixed, being biracial, you know, people making comments about me and having a father that's white and a mother that's black. And, you know, you're, you're too white for the black kids, too black for the white kids, you know, so that kind of dynamic. But I had supportive parents that my mom always, you know, assured me that I was beautiful, I was smart, I had a voice. I don't wanna wait no more. I don't wanna wait, no. I'm currently working on my song that I composed called No More. This is a session that we've been doing today here at Tree Sound, and I'm just trying to make sure that the beat is everything that it needs to be. It's so crazy because I never used to think I could produce. My mom was like, you can do it, you can do it. And I'm like, do you know how hard it is to make a beat? Like, you hear the drums, you hear all this stuff. And now I'm here making my own. Yeah, so I think it'd be cool if we stacked. If we no stack more. some of these yeah. and then the no more is in the last line. You can just run this whole line if you want yeah. and we can kind of pick out what we like. Hey. Marketing plays a role in my music. Everything I'm learning in the classroom has been so helpful in terms of learning strategies. Everything from mission statements to value to like, what do you really want to convey? So my friend and I, we're gonna start a marketing agency, a creative marketing agency for entertainers, for brands. But that's our goal. We're trying to like, at least get it off the ground this year. You know, I got two marketing degrees, so I'm just trying oh, to, yeah, you are. just trying to utilize it. And she's a superstar. And then coming from a cultural town like Atlanta and being at the HBCUs, she has the substance that's needed to make it in the industry. The spirit of excellence, spirit of greatness runs so deep. We are very conscious of the people that came before us and always trying to make it better for the people that come after us. And I'm just ready to show the world what I have to offer. You can't talk about and identify a social movement in this country that wasn't impacted by HBCUs, the Harlem Renaissance. It, it's a litany of black writers and scholars, Langston Hughes, Zora Neale Hurston, they're all HBCU graduates. And they were all very much cultivated and nurtured within these spaces. And so the mere fact that these institutions are open and providing the space for a new Negro movement to flourish, for the Harlem Renaissance to flourish, for a modern civil rights movement to erupt, is this explosion of black student activism which directly confronts white supremacy in America. What we're in the process of doing now is to define that which represents us and to become, to build that. And we have to build independent of the white community. Well, you have a list of leaders that emerged uh, that became major parts of the civil rights movement. Kwame Nkrumah from Howard University. Here in Atlanta, you have Julian Bond. You have uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Jesse Jackson came from North Carolina uh, A&T. Ralph Abernathy came from uh, Alabama State University. Marion Wright Edelman, the Children's Defense Fund, Ruby Dara Smith, all of them came from Spelman College. And so that list goes on and on. When you think about the young people who came together, if it wasn't for an HBCU, they probably would have never crossed paths. If it wasn't for the fact that all of these students had one common interest, that was an HBCU then those HBCUs taught them to believe in themselves and to have pride in who they are. I think the most beautiful thing that we could do would be to stage a mass sit-in or some type of demonstration. And if they did not serve us, to remain until they served us. If arrested, to go in jail and refuse bail. That's what I think will um, have a, a much larger impact than just mere arrest. You had students from HBCUs who were leading the protests, sitting in at Woolworth in Greensboro, North Carolina, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, which was established here in Atlanta. That consisted of students at Morris Brown and Spelman, Clark, and Morehouse, who were taking classes and then on the streets in the afternoon picketing institutions that continue to segregate. And so these institutions served as a training ground uh, for the battle that was theirs.
without this wave of activism that emerges from HBCUs, we don't get a social revolution in this country which shakes America to its very core. And that's what happens with the sit-in movement. Ultimately, that's what happens with the Freedom Riders that emerge in 1961. I am black, beautiful, black, I must be respected, I am somebody. That's not something which happens by happenstance. These students were exposed to generations of ideas which embraced social activism, which embraced race consciousness, which embraced cultural nationalism, uh, and in doing so, it prepared them for that very moment where they were able to step out and challenge America and to pull America closer to its promises of liberty and justice for all. Now is the time to make real the promises of democracy. Now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. It created the momentum for these students to get the gumption and the courage to say, yeah, I'm going to study hard, but I'm going to put on my shoes and we're going to march in the streets. But thank God for the student activism that arose during that era. All of it helped to get the freedoms that were granted to people, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, 65 and 66 because of the student activism. Polling places were swapped by both Negro and white voters, some of whom stood in line for up to four hours before casting their ballots. Many lines stretched for over three blocks. Thousands of Negro voters were voting for the first time in their lives. Great morning, everybody. Okay, so for, of course, we know this weekend what we had with the five teens that were shot. We have received several inquiries about that. Now, we are getting questions about airport gun enforcement following constitutional carry. We have a, a statement we've used, but Morris Diggs, of course, is asking more questions. Why are we doing it as opposed to TSA? So I'll, I will direct them to TSA. We have been talking to TSA about their statement as it relates to this. It's not against the law for anybody to have a gun in the park that we control. Not us, okay. And then, Chief, you're on the front page of the Atlanta Inquirer. Oh, that's pretty cool. Your interview, we're gonna get this framed for you. All right, that's it. All right. What y'all doing? Y'all up to something. Yes, we are. I can tell. You all are up to something. I've been in this position about two years. It was never, ever in my life's path to work in law enforcement. I never saw myself doing this. My background is television, it's journalism. Every day is different. And today is one in which I'm looking at emails that are literally coming in as I sit here and preparing for what we're doing. Hey, Chief. The day can change at the drop of a dime. These are KKK um, flyers that have been left in people's yards. It's saying, beware, race traitors, mixed breeds, communists, homosexuals, and all other walks of godless degeneracy. The Klan is back again and here to stay. So do you better make amends or stay away? Working in this role and having been a student at an HBCU and a professor at an HBCU, it allowed me to see what the concerns are of our youth, of our young people. I've had people who question, why are you even doing the job? Why would you go work for a police department? And my answer is, so I can tell our story and their story. And I think being an HBCU grad and professor gives you a different connection and it makes you really speak out more because you think that could be my child, that could be my brother, that could be my sister. Okay. All right, I'm out. We got work to do. 
So we're headed to the sheriff's office. We meet with the sheriff regularly about public relations needs and things that we can do for outreach. Hey, Sheriff, how are you? I am outstanding, how are you? I'm amazing. She has an amazing All ability right. for so. visualizing what next looks like. Are you gonna do anything on the news to talk about your drones? The level of excellence in which she operates, I don't know many people that can reach that level. We are aware and we are investigating. I believe they are classified as a true hate group. So I'm going to make sure we push, push this and we'll push it on to the reporter and on our um, various platforms. All right, so we'll handle that. We will handle that. I have this saying that I'm rarely ever nervous and I ain't never scared. And that's why I think the HBCU experience is important because it teaches you that even if you're afraid, do it afraid. By the time you reach the 1980s, there will be sort of a renaissance amongst HBCUs, which will be paralleled by a, a, an explosion of HBCUs in black popular culture. Wake up! You're gonna have some movies like School Days, produced by Spike Lee, who's a graduate of Morehouse College. Uh, you're going to have shows like A Different World come on television. I can tell you there's a generation of students, alumni now, who said, I didn't know anything about HBCUs until I saw School Days or until I saw A Different World. When you watched A Different World and the first episodes and Lisa was off to college and it made you want to go to an HBCU. When I look back on it, I grew up in that era of Thursday nights, Cosby show, different world, and a different world, parts of it was filmed on Spelman's campus. And so in my mind, when I thought about going to college, I was like, that's what I want my college experience to be. And that puts black college life front and center for white America in ways in which they had never seen before. You'll see an, an uptick in enrollment in the, in the 1980s and 1990s. I think the culmination of that, the high point of that, is Florida A&M University, an HBCU located in Tallahassee, Florida, being named Time Magazine, Princeton Review, College of the Year, and that was a major feather in their cap. But yet, that doesn't change the fact that many of these institutions were struggling financially to keep their doors open. The slogan changes with the times and with the challenges. The addendum, a call to arms for people to get involved and to recommit to educational equality. When we talk about HBCUs, we talk about the excellence, we talk about the glory, we talk about the alumni, but there are challenges. Challenges from financial support, which I would deem to be probably the major challenge, making sure that the schools are adequately funded. A recent study found nearly 20 black colleges and universities have been underfunded by states for decades. According to Forbes, between 1987 and 2020, 18 HBCUs were underfunded by $8 billion, leaving them operating on thinner budget margins compared to predominantly white schools the challenges that are faced by a lot of HBCUs are exposure, and a lot of the exposure is connected to funding. Not having the money to do the things that they would like to do for their students. Not being able to upgrade facilities as often as they would need to make those necessary changes. Even down to paying professors. You've got top level professors that a lot of schools want to bring in, but if that professor has an opportunity to make two or three times more at a predominantly white institution, oftentimes that's what they're gonna take. The underfunding goes back to literally the existence of these schools. And so they had to go decades and decades not getting the money that they should have had. So it's sort of baked into their existence. It's a substantial amount of money for each school and a substantial amount of money in its totality. I think the federal funding for HBCUs has improved drastically uh, over the years. I think fundraising as a whole for HBCUs through the United Negro College Fund has improved. I think corporate America, and particularly white corporate America, has gained a better understanding of the importance. So I see a drastic improvement, but certainly not enough
I think that HBCUs are constantly pushing the needle and they're becoming more relevant today more than ever. We're excelling so well and that we're, people are seeing that now. Coming from an HBCU, it holds a lot of weight now. I'm not just doing this for myself, I'm doing this for my community as well. And when I depart from this institution, I'm taking that legacy with me because that's attached to me. So I definitely believe that CAU and HBCUs in general do a great job at cultivating the next generation of leaders. My peers, they're strong, they're bold, and they're just ready to go out here and attack the world. There's no doubt about it. A class of 2022, this is your day. We know that we are as strong as the links in our family circle. So as you come to the end of your matriculation at Clark Atlanta University, I ask you to reflect upon the links that form your unbreakable circle. Ladies and gentlemen, our 2022 Commencement Convocation Orator, Miss Pinky Cole. Class of 2022, just by sitting in these seats, you have changed the trajectory of a generation. Everything that you need is already in you. So go, do, and be. With each mistake, it got you a little bit closer to your purpose. So to the mighty class, the mighty graduating class of 2022, I hope you fail, but fail your way on to success. Thank you very much. Lindsay Haberman. Jerry Freeman. People ask, do HBCUs really prepare students for the real world? My answer is not just yes, my answer is hell yes. As we look at the students coming out, they are independent thinkers, they are socially savvy, they have presence. You can get an education anywhere in this country, you know, and you can get a good education anywhere in this country. But to, to be educated within a space um, whose history and tradition and legacy uh, has always been about a tradition of greatness, of young men and women who took it upon themselves to push, pull, drag this country to a more inclusive and tolerant space. When you get an HBCU graduate, you're getting that. You're getting all of that. Don't count yourself out. It only gets better. Trust yourself. Love yourself. Oh. It only gets better. Trust yourself. Love yourself. Oh no, it only gets better
Thank you.